All right, let's go ahead and get started. Thank you everyone for joining and welcome to George Mason University's Observatory. Uh, you can follow us uh, on Twitter at GMU Observatory. You can email us at gmuobservatory at gmail.com. And you can reach our website at science.gmu.edu slash observatory. So here's a picture of our observatory. We're located on top of Research Hall on the Fairfax, Virginia, George Mason campus. We have a dome with a telescope shown on uh, the top of a gray uh, structure on top of the fourth story on the roof of the building. And then to the right, there's a building on top of the roof. That's our control room. And there's a picture here on the left of our control room where we operate the campus telescope. It's shown around the perimeter are just a set of images that have been obtained uh, with our campus telescope by students. I'm Professor Peter Plachan. I'm the director of GMU Observatory. We'll be joined next month by Professor Rob Parks. He's gonna be the deputy, directory, deputy director of the observatory. And we have two observatory TAs who are busy studying for their PhD qualifying exams. Uh, and they are Justin Wittrock and William Matsko. Uh, and they're not able to be here to join us tonight. And we have Brandon Iverson, who's the president of the Friends of the Observatory Student Organization. And I'm pleased to announce that we've selected our tour guides for the 2020-2021 academic year. And you might have some questions about how we're going to be giving tours. They will be virtual. So for our students that take our um, Astronomy 112 class, which is a lab course, you get to uh, take a, a tour of the telescope. And we will be offering uh, virtual private and public tours uh, throughout the academic school year. So feel free to get in touch if you're with a school group or a scout troop. Uh, feel free to send us an email and arrange a tour. And we have uh, some excellent tour guides, graduate students Ryan and Patrick, as well as undergraduates Owen, Ashley, Victor, Brandon, and Andrew. Thanks, Becky. Yeah, we're pretty happy about that. I'd like you to sign up for our free newsletter at uh, science.gmu.edu slash observatory called The Moon, the Mason Observatory Outreach Newsletter. We just put out our second edition once a month. The Moon, get it? Monthly newsletter. Uh, so for those of you who don't know, the origin of the word month has to do with the uh, moon. And uh, another fun fact is the origins of the days of the week have to do with uh, the, the, um, the planets that we in the moon and the sun that we see in the sky. Monday is the moon, Sunday is the sun, Saturday is Saturn. Uh, and Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, or sorry, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, they don't make much sense uh, in the English language, but uh, in Latin languages they do. For example, um, Wednesday in Espanol is Miércoles, which is Mercury. Okay. Uh, so these events are held alternating Monday evenings during the academic year. Our next event is going to be August 27th. Sorry to say that tonight we're in the middle of a severe thunderstorm, so we will not be opening the telescope tonight. But we will have a closed dome virtual tour, so you can take a look at our telescope remotely here tonight. And uh, if and when we're able to reopen, uh, right now we are not able to do so. Uh, we will continue for the fall semester, be having a virtual 30 minute talks appropriate for all ages and interests. And uh, those will be followed by guided telescope tours of that night sky. Sky is very dynamic. The stars you see from night to night are changing. Some of you may have, um, that's our dishwasher going off if you hear that. Uh, some of you may have heard about Comet uh, Neowise uh, and it's made its appearance in the night sky over the past month. If anyone's seen Comet Neowise over the past month, feel free to say that in the chat. Uh, but we are excited about welcoming you back to campus uh, to see our telescope in person in the future. Let me tell you about some upcoming public events we have here at the observatory. Uh, virtually or in person on August 9th at 7 p.m. is the Northern Virginia Astronomy Club monthly meeting. You can find more information about that club at novac.com, N-O-V-A-C.com. 
on August 18th at 8 p.m. I'm really excited to share with you uh, a partnership lecture series with the Smithsonian Associates Program. And there, those do have advanced purchase of tickets are required. It's $25 for non-members and $20 for members of the Smithsonian. And uh, we will have a fantastic lecture on roving for signs of life on Mars. Our guest speaker for that night uh, will be Dr. John Callis. He is the program manager, or was the program manager for the Spirit and Opportunity Mars rovers uh, that landed on Mars uh, in the past before Curiosity, but after the Pathfinder rover landed in 1997. So, um, that event will take place once again, August 18th at 8 p.m. And uh, Dr. John Callis will be our guest speaker. Very timely talk for us to have with the Smithsonian Associates, thanks to the launch this morning of the Perseverance rover. The Perseverance rover, happy to report, as of this morning, is on its way to Mars. It launched upon an Atlas rocket at 7.50 a.m., Eastern time with a, I was, I heard a reported launch time accuracy it was 10 milliseconds early, but they were able to handle that, that amount of uh, error in their launch time, 10 milliseconds. Uh, it went up very fast on uh, some solid rocket boosters and uh, rocketed into space quite fast. Uh, and it's, it's on its way to Mars. It's carrying the Perseverance rover, which is a clone of the um, Curiosity rover currently roving on Mars, nuclear reaction powered, uh, sorry, nuclear um, radioactive decay powered, and um, uh, in in some key differences with the Curiosity rover, instead of uh, being equipped with uh, lab testing, it's equipped with experiments to look for signs of past life on Mars. And one of the key goals of the Perseverance rover is to um, collect samples for a future NASA sample return mission. So we hope in the future that NASA will fly another mission to Mars to retrieve those samples uh, from Jezero Crater, where it's going to be landing on February 21st in 2021. So it's got quite a long way to get there. Uh, and that's when it's, the rover is going to land and hopefully deploy. And the rover has a very special package. It will potentially be the very first uh, flying uh, craft on another planet. And I forget the name of the helicopter, but there is a robotic helicopter, uh, not quite like the quad uh, little um, copters that you can buy at, at toy stores now, but it's uh, two counter rotating blades and it, it will uh, be deployed from underneath uh, the belly of the Perseverance rover, and then the rover will move out of the way, and it'll fly, hopefully, in Mars. Quite an amazing um, engineering feat, if you ask me. And we're looking forward to following that in February. Other events that we have, as I already mentioned, we'll have an additional evening under the stars. These are free and open to the public on August 27th at 8 p.m., September 10th at 8 p.m., uh, and again, September 24th at 8 p.m., and we have some fantastic speakers lined up for you who are not me, uh, but tonight I'm your speaker. I'm, I didn't want to spoil that, but I'll have to introduce myself in a little bit later. Ingenuity, thank you, is the name of the, thank you, Michael, is the name of the helicopter. All right, and then we have one more Smithsonian event. Uh, uh, there's another NOVAC meeting September 7th, or September 13th. On September 15th, we'll have another lecture with the Smithsonian Associates Program, and that's on the fall colors of stars. And I'm really excited to uh, share uh, that event with you. Our speaker is going to be Dr. Natalie Hinkle from the Southwest Research Institute. She's an expert uh, in stellar astrophysics, and it'll be great to have her uh, talk to, uh, talk to um, all of us in attendance. So in terms of, uh, oh, see, I already had this note and I couldn't even remember it. In terms of upcoming celestial events to look forward to this month, in addition to Comet Neowise. I believe uh, the peak brightness of Comet Neowise has passed. If you have any questions in the chat about Neowise, go ahead to uh, and post them. Uh, but uh, we do have some other fantastic celestial events to see. If you want to see Neowise, the best time to look right now is about an hour after sunset, so around 9.30 p.m. 
looking towards the west, uh, basically where the sun goes down. And with right now, as it continues to fade, it'd be ideal if you had a pair of binoculars or a small telescope. And I'm gonna show you a picture of it uh, in a little bit. There will be four planets visible in the night sky throughout August, Jupiter and Saturn, Mars and Venus. Uh, Jupiter and Saturn will be in the southeastern sky after sunset and Mars will become visible mostly after midnight and Venus will be the morning star appearing in the east just before sunrise. One of the key night sky celestial features tonight will be the summer triangle. The three bright stars of Altair, Deneb, and Vega and they form a large triangle in the night sky that could be easily distinguished. I'm continuing to welcome to the new people just joining us. Uh, on August 1st, we have the conjunction of the moon and Jupiter. So that is in just two nights from now at 7.32 p.m. Jupiter, Saturn, and the moon will be visibly close to each other in the night sky. And that will be that night only where all, um, where all uh, three of the celestial objects will be close together. And then the moon will move on its way. Uh, on its path around the night sky. A full moon on August 3rd, the conjunction of the moon and Mars at 4 a.m. Eastern on August 9th. And as previously mentioned, the Perseids will peak on August 11th and 12th. Uh, and it'll be a nice dark sky night on August 19th. Uh, August 13th will be the greatest uh, time to view Venus before sunrise if you're an early riser. Okay. So next, I want to tell you about our patrons of the Observatory Philanthropic Organization. In order to continue to inspire excellence in astronomy at Mason, as well as educating uh, the Washington, D.C. community, we'd like to ask for your help uh, and ask you to join the patrons of the Observatory, which is a, a fully tax-deductible donation to provide support to our students and to uh, continue to use our telescope conduct research with it, do student projects, uh, and, and be tour guides, for example. So we have different support levels available, and these are listed here, and you can find more information about that at science.gmu.edu slash observatory. Here is our picture of Comet Neowise. And so this was taken with our campus telescope a couple of weeks ago. And this is a color composite image taken by Mason undergraduate Michael Reef. He's uh, just going to be a rising junior physics and astronomy major. And he took three separate images in BV and R filters and combined them uh, on his own and processed it. And you'll notice here that we've, um, there's a bit of a, a slight bluish glow off to the right. That's not the, um, the comet, that's actually some uh, light pollution uh, from, because uh, we're pointed very close to the horizon uh, when we took this picture. You'll see uh, we've oversaturated the exposure here on the coma and nucleus of the comet so we can bring out the detail in the tail. And one of the great things about this picture that's really hard to see if you look through uh, binoculars is you can actually see a dark lane in this uh, cometary tail. And that's actually from the shadow of the nucleus and coma onto the tail running through the middle. It's actually the comet's shadow. Uh, the sun is shining in this case from above uh, in the image as we've shown it here. And so we're seeing the shadow of the nucleus and coma of a comet on its tail itself. This was actually taken when the comet was moving, already starting to move away from the sun. Common misconception about comets is that their tails trail away from the direction they're moving. It's actually not the case the tail actually is always pointed away from the sun uh, like a windsock. So the tail actually leads the head of the comet as the comet recedes from the sun. All right, so I'd like to now introduce tonight's speaker. He's Dr. Peter Plafjian, myself. I'm an uh, associate professor here at George Mason Observatory. I'm happy to give tonight's talk uh, because we've got a really great uh, result to share for you. And I put this talk together last night and I've already seen I've got a typo. All right. Uh, but you can follow me on Twitter at Plapchan Peter. And my website is xoexo.gmu.edu. And I'm here to talk to you today about a really exciting discovery that uh, I made with my research group 
uh, just uh, over the past year and a half, and it was announced and was covered on CNN and Fox News a month ago. So I couldn't do uh, the work that I'm presenting here tonight without uh, the wonderful research group I have here at GMU. I just wanna show you the, the six graduate students, 10 undergraduate students, and this summer I even have six high school interns working with me. We're all working virtually uh, this summer. It's been a real pleasure. We're actually doing pretty well, all things considered. Uh, actually, one of our students has an internship at, at Harvard this summer, uh, which is great for her. And uh, we've actually been, if you're curious uh, how we do it, uh, we've been using Discord. I don't know if you've heard of that tool or not. I can't uh, say enough about it. It's really great. Uh, if any of you have ever used Zoom, well, you're connected to Zoom right now. And uh, if any of you have ever used Slack, it's like the two of those things combined together. Uh, so it's got uh, a Slack channel like chat rooms, in addition to audio, video, and screen sharing channels. And we've been working together every day. We have these hack sessions. We're all logged in uh, at the same time. And uh, it's been a real pleasure to work with all these students in my, in my group this summer. So let's talk about the topic at hand. We know that stars form from clouds of dust and gas. And due to the conservation of angular momentum and collisions, the leftover material from the formation, uh, one second, someone's ringing our doorbell. I think it's a delivery, but let me check with my wife, talk about the live demos. Okay, I'm back. I asked my wife to check out the, uh, the doorbell ringing. Um, so the leftover material from the formation of the star settles into a spinning disk of debris. This is an artist rendition of a newborn star, but we see plenty of examples with the Hubble Space Telescope and other facilities, I'll show you in the future uh, slides, where we could see these baby stars being born. Did you have to sign for? Oh, I know what that is, okay. Ah, it's something, something for me actually, just got delivered. Did you have to sign for it? Okay. All right. Uh, so this is uh, images of the Orion Nebula taken with the Hubble Space Telescope. And these are actually pretty old images, 25 year old images. Uh, but you can see these newborn stars uh, illuminated against a backdrop of the leftover gas from which these stars formed. Uh, it, you can see it, this is a little fuzzy blob in the constellation of Orion. And so we know that this is how stars form. The leftover material settles into these disks. And over time, uh, we know that these disks probably form planets. Uh, well, they must form planets because we now know of over 4,000 planets uh, orbiting other stars. And so the stars then go through this kind of planet building phase where this leftover material, leftover from the formation of the star, coalesces into planetary systems. Uh, we call this the debris phase, uh, where it's a lot like a construction zone. If you've ever seen a new house under construction and gone around to see um, the, the area around the house, you'll find a lot of sawdust and pieces of wood and construction materials left over. And we've actually, as astronomers, have developed tools to find that debris left over from the construction, so to speak, of planetary systems and stars. We call them debris disks. Really what we're detecting is very small solid particles, really cons with the solid consistency of smoke grains, about one micron in size, one millionth of a meter, but pervasive and being left over around distant stars. And we detect those through their infrared glow. Uh, so we see lots of evidence of planet forming disks. This shows um, a, a facility that's new called ALMA, located uh, in the mountains of Chile, the, one of the two best sites in the world to have professional observational telescopes. I'm gonna tell you about the other place uh, later in my talk today. And these are, whoops, let's see if I can go back. Uh, these are real images of uh, newborn, in the process of being born planetary systems. And we can't see the plants themselves here. We're actually seeing the gas uh, left over and we can see this, there's gaps and rings and in cases spiral arms forming in these um, 
what we think are forming planetary systems. So we know something has to be acting on this debris and we think there's planets there, but we've never uh, seen the planets directly until recently. Uh, we've seen more mature planetary systems like this uh, burnt to a crisp planet known as 55 Cancri E. We've detected over 4,000 planets around other stars where the stars are older. So we have this evidence where we see the materials from which plants should form with the images that I've just shown you. And we see evidence for mature planetary systems uh, like this one. And this particular planet has to pass in, happens to pass in front of its star. Um, but there's, there's this one planet I'm going to show you. How do we detect planets in the first place? This is the star Beta Pictoris. It's the second brightest star in the constellation of Pictoris. And we've developed techniques to block out the light from the star called coronography. And uh, starting in the 2000s, within the last 20 years, uh, this particular star was revealed to have a disk around it. And then in 2003 and 2008, we saw a planet go outside um, of the block, the block for the starlight. And we were able to see the planet uh, orbiting uh, that star. So this is a planet about eight times the mass of Jupiter. And this video that I'm showing you is the best image we've ever taken of a planet around another star. That's it. Those are all the pixels. I'll show you one more time. So it's beta pick B. So this is a directly imaged planet. This one is a bit older than the one I'm going to talk about today. Uh, so it's not as, uh, unfortunately, it's not as exciting as the one I'm going to show you now. But the majority of planets that we find are not by directly imaging the planets themselves. We've done that for a few dozen planets now, but well over several thousand planets have been found with what's called the transit method. And that's when the planet passes in front of the star with respect to our line of sight and causes a mini eclipse. So if we monitor the brightness of the star as a function on the time, as a function of time, as like shown in this illustration on the bottom, we get what we call a transiting exoplanet. And this is a, a nice show you that animation one more time. We see a dip in brightness. Now that dip in brightness may seem a very easy to see by eye here, but uh, this is an illustration. And in reality, seeing these changes in brightnesses of stars uh, are quite hard. Uh, as a case in point, uh, if we have a Jupiter-sized planet passing in front of a sun-like star, because the size of the planet, I don't know what happened there, bear with me. I think I skipped ahead. Ah, okay. There we go. Let's just advance my slides back to where we were. Um, a, a, because a Jupiter-like planet is one-tenth the diameter of a star like our sun, it will block 1% the ratio of the circles, areas of circles of the light coming from that star. For an Earth-sized planet, which is another 10 times smaller than Jupiter, it will block 0.01% the change uh, in the change of the brightness of the star. And that's 100 parts per million. And we can do that thanks to space missions like the Kepler mission, which launched in March 2009 uh, and used the um, transit method to scan 150,000 stars in the constellation of Cygnus and Lyra, and it found over 5,000 exoplanet candidates, over 1,000 of which have now been confirmed. More recently, two years ago, the NASA test mission launched. I'm going to show you a video here about the NASA test mission. I don't know if you can hear audio or not, but if not, that's okay. Um, the NASA test mission is the successor to Kepler, uh, in some respects, it's trying to find the nearest, brightest stars with transiting planets. And over the course of two years, it maps most of the night sky using four cameras. So it has four different cameras, each covering an area of 23 by 23 degrees on the sky. So it can cover roughly most of the entire sky with only 26 pointings. And to give you an idea of what 23 by 23 degrees means, 23 by 23 degrees 
is more than you could fit more than 400 full moons inside each one of those camera views. So they look at enormous swaths of the sky at one time. And every 27 days, it repoints its cameras to look at a new sector, as we call it. So continues the map. And in the first year, it observed the first hemisphere of the sky, what we call the Southern Ecliptic Hemisphere of the sky. The overlap of the regions by the pole are optimized for James, w, James Webb Space Telescope's continuous viewing zone. And after the first year, it transitions to mapping the other half of the sky. And the test mission has actually just completed this first two years of its primary mission. And thanks to, thanks to uh, funding from NASA, the test mission is now continuing to revisit uh, many of these fields. And the very first sector of observations uh, revisited took place uh, from starting July 4th and is actually ending tomorrow. Uh, so it's now in its what's called the extended mission. Another, more on test later, another method that we use to detect exoplanets, which we also use here at George Mason, uh, is the Doppler method. The Doppler method is another indirect method. And it's a little bit more difficult to understand. But to briefly summarize what happens, if you can, you might have heard in elementary school that planets go around the sun. And that's actually not true. Uh, planets actually orbit what's called a common center of mass. If you imagine two people on a seesaw and you have a balance point or a fulcrum in the middle of the seesaw, that balance point is called the center of mass in physics speak. Uh, for the location where all the masses balance out. Uh, and thanks to Newton's laws of gravity, that balance point for all the planets and the sun in our solar system are where all the planets and the sun uh, uh, move around. And so it's exaggerated here in this video, which I'll replay. Uh, but just as the planet orbits around the sun, because the sun is exerting a gravitational pull on it, thanks to Newton's third law of motion, there's an equal and opposite reaction. The planet pulls on the star. And so the star actually wobbles as the planet goes around it. And thanks to another trick of physics, when a star is coming towards us, the light from that star is ever so slightly blue shifted. And when a star is moving away from us, the light from that star is ever so slightly red shifted. We call that the Doppler effect. You might have heard of the Doppler effect with regards to sound. When you have an object moving fast and towards you and making a sound, it'll sound higher in pitch and vice versa when it's moving away. Like as a fast car passes you. That's the Doppler method and the same thing happens to light and astronomers I figured out how to take light from stars and watch stars move back and forth. And if we know stars are moving back and forth, thanks to Newton's laws, if there's something causing the star to change in velocity, change in speed, that implies there's something tugging on it. And that something could be another star or it could be a planetary system. And so by watching how strong the tugs are, and how often they repeat, we actually can tell that there's planetary systems. And I think approaching a thousand planets now have been discovered with the Doppler technique. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to post them in the Q&A and we will in the chat and we will uh, talk, um, answer those questions later uh, in tonight's show. So interestingly enough, with the transit method, we get the diameter of the planet. And with the Doppler method, it's really an indirect way of weighing the planet. It's getting its mass. And so with special planets for which we can both see them transit and see the, their stars wobble, we can get their mass and their volume. And mass divided by volume is density. In other words, 
for these special planets that transit and for which we can also see their stars wobble, we can find out what they're made of. We can study their atmospheric composition and learn about their dynamical evolution. And of course, uh, shown here on the right are Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. We can't look inside of these planets, uh, although we did send um, a probe with the Galileo mission into the atmosphere of, of Saturn, and we did crash uh, Cassini, uh, or sorry, into the atmosphere of Jupiter, and we did crash Cassini into Saturn's atmosphere. Uh, but we can figure out from size and uh, mass from the moons of these planets, how much the planets weigh, and thus figure out what their interiors are likely to be made of. So for planets around other stars, it's great if we can do this, and then we can learn about how they're made. So at the beginning of my talk, I showed you how we've imaged newborn planetary systems, plants in the process of being made. And with the Doppler technique and the transit technique, and even in the case of direct imaging, we've actually been able to take pictures of planets orbiting other stars. Shown here on the right is the star and planetary system HR8799. Here the light from the star has been blocked out to see the faint glow of four massive Jovian planets orbiting uh, beyond um, the equivalent to the Jovian planets in our own solar system, we actually see them going around the star. It's really fascinating. This is one of now two uh, planetary systems for which we've seen multiple planets in orbit, in orbit around its star. But wouldn't it be nice if we could find something in the middle? It actually tells us more about this process, about how these planets came to be, to connect the dots between very young newborn stars that have a lot of construction debris and these more mature planetary systems and learn more about how they got there. So that's what I've been doing. And I've been surveying a bunch of young low mass stars with the Doppler technique since 2010, uh, using a specialized approach at near infrared wavelengths. Those are wavelengths of light that are redder than red. And so what we do is we take what's called a spectrum of the star. We divide its light into its colors so that we can detect that very subtle red shift and blue shift exaggerated here in this movie. The, the picture, the, the colors of the star are shown in red. The brightness of the star is a function of wavelength or color. And then we pass it through a special gas uh, called a methane isotopolog absorption gas cell that imprints upon the light uh, from the star another set of lines that don't move. And why, why do we do this? It's because the changes in velocity of the stars that we're trying to detect, the changes in the speed are incredibly small. Uh, a planet like uh, Jupiter orbiting our sun causes the star to wobble back and forth with a change in speed of around 24 meters per second. Uh, and uh, that's around 70-ish uh, or 80-ish feet per second. That's actually uh, very easy to do these days. But for an Earth-sized planet, the, ch the chain going around and say the habitable zone, you know, same distance from its star as our star, that would cause the, the blue shifting and red shifting of the light from the star to change only by a total velocity change of 18 centimeters per second. That's equivalent to turtle speeds. So we've been looking and we use this specialized technique where we have these nice, easily identified line from, lines from the gas, and then we can compare them to the positions of the lines from the star. And we do exactly what they tell us not to do in high school physics, which is take two very large numbers, the motion of the lines from the gas cell, which can be many pixels in our, in our instruments, and the motions of the line from the star to get the relative motion of the star compared to the Earth. And then we pack it up and we fly to Hawaii and I get off the plane in Hawaii and everyone thinks I'm crazy because I, I have a winter jacket in my arms. And we, we drive to the summit of Mauna Kea. Mauna Kea is a dormant volcano on the big island of Hawaii. 
and it rises to an elevation of nearly 14,000 feet above sea level. Here we're one mile above sea level, and the mountain is up ahead of us, and we're gonna drive up to the summit in this time-lapse video. Uh, don't drive this fast in real life. Um, and now we get to a dirt road, to because we're now above 10,000 feet elevation, and your brain starts getting less oxygen here. I don't know if any of you have been above 10,000 feet elevation, but we're past the point where vegetation exists. It looks like Mars up here. There's just not enough um, carbon dioxide and, and oxygen for vegetation to survive. And there's some snow uh, that we just passed on the road there. Uh, it actually gets really cold up here. And I got some great pictures to show you in a little bit. And finally, we arrive at our telescopes. Uh, and this is the Keck telescope. So we see um, this is the world's best site there's no other place in the world where there's the least amount of light pollution, the clearest weather above the clouds uh, with the largest number of clear nights per year. And here's a picture of our telescope. Uh, it's the NASA Infrared Telescope Facility. This is me standing in front of it. And look at that, there's some snow. This was a day when we went to the summit of Mauna Kea in 2012. Uh, and it was after a fresh blizzard on the summit. And when we were driving with the, the day crew, as they're called, the engineers that maintain the telescope, they said, you know, if, if, our, if our truck starts sliding, keep your seatbelt unbuckled because you might want to jump out uh, because there's a, you know, a big giant drop off just off the side of that dirt road. Thankfully, uh, we did survive. I did have actually a colleague of mine once roll off that road. And fortunately, uh, his uh, vehicle, um, he survived. Uh, it didn't fall that far. Uh, but here we are um, at the summit of Mount Achaia. And this is just after a blizzard. So here we are, just proof that you do actually shovel snow in Hawaii. Um, and uh, there we are digging out. Uh, it's quite a workout at 14,000 feet elevation. Uh, but it's well worth it. Here's our gas cell uh, put into our spectrometer. Here's a picture of the telescope. For scale, this is a railing. So you'll see there's kind of dirt marks. This is actually where people walk uh, to get to the telescope. And then underneath the telescope, there's our spectrograph in red, uh, where we collect data uh, on the stars that we look at. Uh, we also use facilities, uh, in addition to the GMU Observatory, I am a co-principal investigator. There's me on the right of the, whoops, went back, of the Minerva Telescope Arrays. This one's located on the summit of Mount Hopkins in Arizona. And these are five fully robotic telescopes uh, executing a choreographed motion here. Uh, and on the bottom right here, we have um, five more of these telescopes outside Toowoomba, Australia. Thanks to the round earth, the telescopes we have in Arizona can't see the same stars so we, uh, that you can in Australia. So we put another array of telescopes down there, down under. And I had the pleasure of visiting those last year. Each one of these telescopes costs about $210,000. Funding for these projects come from private donors, uh, such as um, if you, you know, such as the patrons philanthropic organization, as well as um, the uh, uh, National Science Foundation and NASA. So we monitored a bunch of these stars uh, starting over 10 years ago. I, I built that gas cell uh, a lot years ago. And for the past 10 years, We've been surveying a lot of these young stars to look for evidence of newborn planets. And a few of these stars caught our attention because the stars appeared to be changing in their velocity, implying that there might be planets in orbit around them. But there was a problem. These stars were young. And so they have a lot of activity going on the surface of their stars, flares and uh, star spots and things called plages and bright regions like uh, this uh, particular wavelength observation of our sun uh, shown here. This is actually a real data showing our sun in, in a very specific wavelength. And you can see the activity on the surface of our own sun 
And so when we have these active regions rotating into view or rotating out of view, they can look like planets going around the star instead. So we didn't know what was going on with some of these stars. So we took a closer look and they did not show uh, the expected uh, behavior. Because stars have temperature, the brightness of the star is a function of wavelength changes. But these, one of these stars in particular was very, very, it was changing in velocity at wavelengths of the, in the near infrared rather than red, but it was doing it more than we expected. Uh, if we looked at it at visible wavelengths, the variability was about the same size, whereas we would have expected it to be much bigger. Uh, and in addition to that, the the variations we were seeing in the brightness of the, uh, of the velocity star didn't match how fast we knew the spin, uh, how fast we knew the star was spinning. We knew the star happened to be spinning uh, about once every 4.863 days. Uh, it, we knew it was a particular type of star called a BY Draconis variable uh, because we saw this pattern of spots rotating into and out of view uh, someone's drawing on the screen, so let me, or that might be me. Let me disable that. Okay, I don't actually know how to do that. There we go. Um, uh, and uh, this star's velocity wasn't changing in sync with its spin. So we knew spots were rotating into and out of view, and those spots lived a long time, but something didn't add up. The star was AUMIC. Sorry, I lost my mouse for a second. There we go. Uh, and this star, Eumic, happens to have a debris disk, like the one we saw earlier around Beta Pick B. And this star, we've actually been studying the star on purpose. We knew it was young. We knew it had construction debris, but no one had ever seen a planet around it. Uh, and so we realized that if this star was changing in a velocity in a way that looked like a planet, and since it, in addition to that, it had this disk of debris and astronomers have been watching it for years and we could actually see clumps of debris moving through this disk, uh, shown here in observations that were taken. Uh, so the stars to the right, and this is a very um, highly contrasted view, uh, exaggerated structure showing the structure in the disk, but we could actually see clumps in this disk moving from year to year. Uh, and so if some of this Doppler variability was observed was due to planets, and since we knew this disk was almost perfectly edge on, and if, if the velocity variations we were seeing were from a planet, then maybe that planet would pass in front of its star and be one of those special planets that causes a transit or an eclipse. And so two years ago, the NASA test mission took a look at our star. And that data became public on December 6th of 2018. And here's uh, shown here, the brightness of the star is a function of time. So once again, we see the, the star changing in brightness every 4.863 days. There's a gap due to the test uh, data downloading from the spacecraft every 13 and a half days. Um, so that was, that was what we expected. And we could see very sharp increases in the brightness of the star. Those are flares, the star is very active and very young, but my, something caught my eye where this little letter B is located, a very peculiar change in brightness. So we took a closer look and there was something that looked like a transit, uh, a, a brief dip in the brightness of the star. And then it returned to kind of its regular uh, modulation. And there was the first one and the second one. So we thought maybe maybe we're on to something. And 
uh, honestly, for the first 48 hours after I saw this on December 6th, I was in disbelief that uh, the planet we had thought might be there all along really was there. And we also saw an interesting additional event, uh, event that looked like it might be something, but we, we still don't know yet today. And so we followed it up with the Spitzer Space Telescope and we saw it again. And the Spitzer Space Telescope operates at a different wavelength of light than the NASA test mission. And so the fact that we saw this different brightness at two different wavelengths at the predicted time based upon these two events we had on the left, we knew we had a transiting young exoplanet for which we could measure its diameter and its mass. So we cleaned up the light curves and did our analysis and indeed uh, fit models to the brightness of the star as a function of time to model exactly how big this planet was and what its orbital period was. And NASA uh, made this video to commemorate this discovery, which was published in Nature on um, June 25th, uh, just one month ago. And I will play it for you. I don't know if you'll be able to hear it. So please let me know in the chat if, maybe I'll take my headphones. Eh. Uh, please let me know in the chat if you can hear it. Do you hear anything yet? Here's the, no sound. Okay, so this is Spitzer, thank you. The Spitzer and test missions. The system will be a touchstone for understanding planetary formation for decades to come. So the age of star is 22 million years old, surrounded by a vast disk of dust, like I mentioned. And the planet orbits very close to its star once every 8.46 days. This is an artist's illustration. We think it's about the same size as Neptune and actually around the same mass as Neptune as well. Actually a bit of a surprise, uh, but we did find the transits. Uh, here's the Spitzer Space Telescope, um, which has now been decommissioned. Uh, here's an animation of the host star and its activity. And you can see how the flares and other features on the surface star made it hard to find a planet. So we had to remove these events from the data to see and bring out the transits themselves. And so AUMIC will be a, a laboratory for studying how planets form for decades to come, understanding us, uh, telling us about the development and evolution of planetary systems. And it's really exciting that right now, the test mission is observing AUMIC again. And in a few more months, September, October, we'll get the next batch of data and maybe we'll confirm that other planet too. Uh, or maybe we'll see something else that we didn't expect. So this was published uh, and Nature is one of the top two um, scientific publications out there uh, in the world. And we're very fortunate to um, have gotten this publication. I have like a bad pixel on my monitor. Uh, and NASA made a poster uh, of, and it says, beware of the terrible tantrum of an angry young star. Uh, and I like showing this because uh, it says that uh, beware, there's no escaping the stellar fury of this system. The monstrous flares of AUMIC will have you begging for eternal darkness. So it's a brand new uh, planetary system. And we've since been following it up. Well, the first question we wanted to know, is it aligned with the disk? I mean, is it actually tilted this way? Is, we know it's edge on, but it could be some other angle. And we've shown that it's actually aligned with the disk four different observatories around the world in uh, 2019 followed up this system. That was a really exciting discovery. We're able to see the shadow of the planet in the spectra of the star as the planet goes in front of the star. And that's how we're able to tell and measure that the planet actually goes across the star in the same direction the star is turning. And we know the star is turning in the same direction the disk is going around the star. So we know that this planet formed inside of the disk. And since the star is only 22 million years old, we get to ask a whole ton of questions, which I'll get to in a second. One of them is, can we use the planet itself to learn about the star? And the answer is yes. There was a paper um, that I'm 
you know, very lucky to have been a part of, where we modeled the winds from the star. The star's so young, you saw all those flares that it's giving off winds that could be up to a thousand times the winds from our sun. You're like, winds from our sun? Isn't it space, a vacuum? What are you talking about, winds from a star? What we're talking about there is charged particles, protons and electrons shooting out from the surface of the star, accelerated by the magnetic fields of the star. Our sun does the same thing. You know, in addition to photons, light coming from our sun, our earth is actually getting bombarded by protons and electrons constantly. We call it the solar wind. It what's, it's what gives us the aurora. Uh, and it's the earth's magnetic field that protects us here on the surface uh, from those solar winds. And that for AUMIC, because it's so young, uh, we actually don't know what the strength of its wind is, but as it turns out, by measuring how extended the atmosphere from the planet is, we're actually gonna be able to tell how strong the wind is because the stronger the wind is, the tighter the atmosphere around the planet is going to be. Uh, so we wanna know a whole ton of questions. Is this planet really fluffy? Cause it just formed, maybe it hasn't condensed all the way yet. The star's only 22 million years old, only, that sounds like a lot in human lifetime, but compare that to our sun at 5 billion years old. And it's only 8.46 days uh, in orbit around its star. It's very close, closer than Mercury in our solar system, which orbits once every 90 days. And so did it form there? Or did it form further out and then move closer to the star in a very short amount of time? And so when we start characterizing the atmosphere of this planet with the Hubble Space Telescope and the CHEOPS European mission over the next couple of years, uh, we'll find out some information about how that planet formed and what its atmosphere looks like. So that's a really exciting future to unlocking the clues of planet formation around other stars. This is just one uh, planet of many that uh, have been discovered over the, past, um, over the past two years with the NASA test mission. And so uh, at this point in time, I'm happy to take any questions and thank you uh, for your time. And then after that, we'll give you a brief uh, telescope tour. So I'll pause for questions. Uh, and if you have any questions, you can type them into the chat. Okay, uh, while we're waiting for questions, um, thank you for uh, sticking around to listen to my talk and talk about this planet discovery. I'm happy to answer any questions about uh, that planet discovery or anything else in the night sky. What I'm showing you now is a live view of our campus observatory and we're gonna give you a tour in a little bit. Um, okay, so what we have here in the lower left is our dome. You can see it's dark outside and it, we've had a thunderstorm. So unfortunately, we can't open the telescope tonight. In the upper left though, we can see the telescope uh, in the upper left and there's our control room in the upper right. And this, uh, thank you, uh, Kelly. Uh, so this is a view of the night sky uh, shown, whoops, let me disappear. Let me bring it back up. And uh, we have a virtual view of the night sky that lets us move the telescope. Uh, unfortunately, oh yeah, someone would like a link to the Nature publication after the talk. So if you uh, follow us on Twitter or go to, uh, if you go to uh, twitter.com slash GMU Observatory, uh, or you find my Twitter account, uh, Plafchan Peter, uh, you can find a, a link to the, the publication. So unfortunately we can't open the dome tonight, but I can move the telescope and give you a, a look at it. So the first thing I'm gonna do is turn the dome. Uh, we're gonna watch it spin here. And so you can see in the live view, just with the press of a button, we can cause this dome to turn. And we can see the dome turn in both camera views. 
Uh, and unfortunately, I can't open up tonight, but uh, it is overcast and it did just rain. Great. I'll go ahead and now park the telescope and uh, the dome. Uh, and what we're seeing here is the telescope tube is in white. We're looking at, at a um, night vision camera. Uh, it's actually dark in the dome. I actually turn a light on in the dome. Why don't I do that? Uh, that's not it. Let me go to here. That's not it either. Let me minimize this for a second and start the lamp controller. There it is. And bring up the view again. Uh, and for those of you who have joined us in the past, um, this will be somewhat repetitious, but uh, we'll, we'll still give you some nice views of the telescope. I'm gonna connect to the lamp and turn it on. You'll see a brief flash in the dome except we didn't, that's a little strange. Hmm, there we go. Just a little bit of a delay there. <laughs> okay, uh, there's the lamp turning on inside of the dome. Uh, and you can see the camera kind of adjusts its, ex its exposure time. So I'll go ahead and turn that lamp back off. It's not gonna make much of a difference. Uh, and there it goes off and then the camera exposure will adjust. Uh, and then we'll go ahead and uh, disconnect from the, um, lamp controller, and now we're gonna move the telescope around to show you different views of the telescope. So uh, unfortunately we can't look at Saturn tonight, although it is there. So I want to, I think I want to look roughly over here and I'm gonna point the telescope. It's not gonna like me because I'm gonna send it very low to the horizon and we're gonna watch it turn uh, here on the camera. I guess because of the rain, there's a bit of a lag in the video feed. But here it goes. You can see a little finder scope attached to the side of the telescope. There's actually two different motors, one that turns this fork and that tracks the rotation of the sky as the earth turns over the course of the night and then the orthogonal or perpendicular direction uh, that points the telescope up and down. And so we call these right ascension and declination motors, very similar to latitude and longitude directions here on the earth. So we're getting another look here at the side of the telescope. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, bring this down here and uh, adjust our view a little bit more. I kind of went the wrong way. And we'll bring the telescope, uh, once it's finished moving, uh, closer to the webcam. As soon as it's finished settling down. Good, here we go. There's another move. Uh, and so now the telescope should come point straight at the camera. And you can see, um, just for scale, there's a doorway. That's a human-sized doorway uh, in the lower left. Uh, uh, the view of the dome. And we start seeing the opening to the telescope rotating into view here. Uh, there is a structure there holding up a little mirror uh, that will collect light that bounces off the big mirror, which is gonna point at us here in a little bit. I have to go a little bit closer to the horizon now. <coughs> Take a sip of water. Here we go. And now we actually see the big mirror of the telescope coming into view. There it is. Can't quite see the webcam, but it's there. Uh, and so this is the primary mirror, as we call it, the big mirror, 32 inches across. The light from the sky would normally come in like you're looking at the screen. It bounces off of the big mirror and then reflects back up to the little mirror, which does block a little bit of the light. Uh, but it catches the light coming off of the big mirror and sends it back down to a hole in the, in the middle of the primary mirror, in the middle of the big telescope. And then it goes to the other side. And what's on the other side? Let's go take a look.
we'll do this in two moves. And again, if you have any questions, feel free to post them in the chat. We now see the back side of the telescope starting to come into view. And on the back side of the telescope, we have a third mirror, which reflects the light to that black structure there. That's a digital camera. It's a specialized digital camera, very similar to the ones you have on your cell phones or, or digital cameras that you take photos with, but specialized for astronomy. Uh, we run it at very cold temperatures. And let me give you a closer look at that now. There's also an eyepiece there that you can see so we can look through this telescope once the pandemic is over. And here's the camera. Um, and um, there's actually a third instrument there that comes into view. Uh, and now we're looking at the back of the primary mirror. There we go. Uh, and there we can see uh, the digital camera. And normally on future nights, we invite you back. We'll give you some virtual views through that camera, uh, through our uh, camera control view. And I did show you Comet uh, Neowise earlier today, taken with the Campus Telescope. And let me just give you, to conclude tonight, we'll take a look at a few more uh, of these views. And so let me go ahead and Park the telescope. Bring it back to where it started. I talked about the Orion Nebula at the beginning of our talk. Uh, and here it is, uh, shown with um, uh, shown with uh, our campus telescope in uh, full color. Uh, it's taken to show you some, some detail in the nebula where these baby stars are, are saturated in this view, uh, overexposed. But we see newborn baby stars here, not as great as the Hubble Space Telescope, but a, it's a wonderful view. Uh, and we've got another view of the Orion Nebula here. Uh, and then over here, we have the M51 uh, Whirlpool Galaxy. I love showing pictures of galaxies because this is the light of a hundred billion stars that have traveled millions of light years uh, to get here. And you can see this is a spiral galaxy like our own Milky Way, but seen edge on uh, from very far away. And you can see this galaxy has a satellite galaxy uh, similar to the large and small Magellanic clouds that you can see from the Southern hemisphere, but, but larger. Uh, and um, next, I want to show you the Crab Nebula. Amazing. Oh, this is another galaxy. Sorry, M33, another spiral galaxy. This one came out pretty good, taken with our campus telescope. And apologies if I'm not leaving these up long enough. But uh, uh, thank you, Asha, for joining. This is the Crab Nebula, taken with our campus telescope. And uh, I love showing this image because it's the leftover remnants of a star that went supernova almost a thousand years ago in the year 1054 AD. During that time, Europe was in the middle of the Middle Ages. And so they were pretty inwardly focused on what was going on on, on earthly matters. But Chinese astronomers and other cultures around the world Notice in that year, uh, in their historical books, a new star that had appeared in the sky and slowly faded and roughly where in the sky uh, it was found. And centuries later, after the invention of telescopes 400 years ago, astronomers went back and rediscovered 
this remnant of a star more than 25 times the mass of our sun that went supernova when it died. We have a question uh, from the audience. How big is our campus telescope? Uh, it weighs several tons. Uh, the diameter of the, the primary mirror that we looked at earlier is about 32 inches across, 0 0.8 meters. Uh, and uh, I think it's really fascinating that we can control it here uh, with the, the click of a button. Uh, oops, actually, I don't know if I want to load that one. Um, sure, why not? Here's a nice view of the Ring Nebula coming up. There it is. I'm going to change the stretch and zoom in on it. This is actually what happens to stars like our sun when they die. Uh, they slough off the outer layers of the star, uh, leaving behind these beautiful, uh, very picturesque views. So let me bring it back up. There it is. I'm going to zoom in on it a little bit further. And it has to do with the instabilities of nuclear fusion at the end of the life of a star. Um, it has multiple rounds of nuclear fusion going on. And um, it causes those instabilities, cause the outer layers of the star to explode off in a fairly gentle explosion out into space, leaving behind a core uh, white dwarf star uh, shown in, um, in this image. Uh, and there, there is a nice view of the um, ring nebula taken with our, our campus telescope. All right, so with that, I'd like to thank you for joining us tonight. This will be recorded. It will be posted to our website, science.gmu.observatory slash, um, sorry, science.gmu.edu slash observatory. And uh, feel free to uh, click on the detailed website, sign up for our newsletter, uh, and um, get additional information about our observatory in the future. Thank you for joining us, everyone. Have a, a safe weekend, and good luck uh, with um, the pandemic that we're all dealing with. I hope everyone is healthy and safe. All right, thank you, everyone. Good night.